the Danish story uh, is that, um, amazingly enough, um, there seems to be a lot of backing for the, this, this uh, green conversion or revolution in the Danish society. When, um, when we last year, in these days, decided upon a very ambitious 2020 target, 95% uh, of the seats in parliament voted for uh, this, uh, this new law. Uh, and also Danish industries, the cultural sector, everybody supports it. It's a very amazing uh, thing, but very helpful, uh, by the way. Um, and, and the story is that um, right now, we in the Danish society as such, we use around 850 petajoules of energy. And um, when we approach 2050, well, everything shall be turned green, uh, uh, renewables. Uh, and at the same time, we expect to grow the economy, more or less to double the GDP over the next uh, 40 years. So without, uh, I mean, how can we make this equation uh, I mean, run only by efficient energy efficiency, very, very harsh measures on energy efficiency, and also, as, as Jan uh, told us, about in, uh, the electrification, because electricity is such an efficient uh, tool to, to, um, to combat um, uh, energy consumption. So, so that's part of the equation. The other part of the equation is that in the renewable side, well, when we did a study uh, two, three years ago, we had a climate commission doing a, a thorough study saying, okay, how can we decarbonize uh, the Danish society up to 2050? Is it doable? Yes, it is doable. We can do it. We do have the technology at hand, more or less. Secondly, is it feasible from a, a financial point of view and from a competitive point of view? Yes, it is feasible. It will not destroy the Danes' competitiveness going uh, down this road, as also Jan confirmed in his study. We did a similar study in EnergyNet because we have, in fact, also the responsibility for security of supply. And we do also have the responsibility of an efficient integration of renewable in the Danish society. So it is affordable for industry. It's affordable for, uh, for consumers. And it shows exactly the same. It is doable. And we can do it without destroying the competitiveness of the economy if we do it right. If we do it right, because the cost can't be too high. We see that in Germany right now, because they did not build out the transmission capacity in due time. And that's the reason why now the cost of this conversion goes through the roof. And we have some social unrest because of that. But it can be done right. And, and as I'll, put this, I'll give some ingredients as we see it, uh, how, how to do it right. Uh, so basically, when we approach 2050, uh, our studies show, yes, we have plenty of wind. We have, I mean, more three, four, five times as much wind resources as we need as we approach 2050. But also, we have some, uh, some uh, biomass that we already today use. As you can see, it's a big chunk. Uh, but also, waste uh, is going through, through uh, this uh, combined heat and power so processes. We have taken out three weeks uh, in November from last year. You can see the pattern here, the gray, that's, that's the load. Uh, you can see the weekends, you can see the spikes uh, when we had cooking in the evening. Um, and, um, and that's approximately, the, it was 32% of classic demand uh, we had as in wind. The wind uh, accounted for 32% last year uh, of the total consumption. And you can see the green part here. That's the wind production. 2020 is uh, seven years ahead, and uh, the plan has been laid down. We will build a number of offshore wind parks. Uh, we are now uh, constructing the, the, the offshore platforms and <coughs> taking, uh, taking the power uh, ashore. And you can see here now, we see that, uh, that in many more hours, we have much more wind uh, generation than we can consume. Moving to 2035, because also the politicians said in 2035, we're not allowed any longer to use uh, coal, oil, or gas for, for heat and power production. Uh, we would have to turn these sectors green. The only le thing left then in 2035 would be transportation, but it will take, take something longer. And that means that about 80% of classic demand will then be covered by, uh, by wind. 
rest by biomass, basically. And then we go to 2050, uh, and uh, that's a wrong scale. If we take the, the, the right scale, that would be the picture. And then you can see really the challenge we have in front of us in terms of how to, to balance, how to make sure we have security of supply also in, 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 in 2050. We have some, um, some peaks and some valleys. We have, uh, we have more production here. How do we solve it? Well, first of all, I want to highlight that you cannot have 32% wind in your system, not even 20% wind in your system, if you do not have a well-functioning market. The market has to deliver most of these balancing services. So that allow the, the, the power to flow where the willingness to pay is highest. We, do not, we are not allowed to shut down wind turbines in Denmark. They will always produce. That means that, that it's critically important for us that the market will can then absorb and give the right price signals to, uh, to, the, for the, to the other production facilities we have. So if you, if you do not have a market, I'm, I, th uh, I do know you have a market here in Ireland, but also to, to see the market in a bigger perspective. Uh, now in, in, in our part, we have had the Nordic market for many years, and now we're developing the Western European market, and, and that is helping us. I mean, beyond expectation. Second thing is interconnectors. I'll come back to that. It is that the, to be able to balance the system across a nation and to share resources, to share reserves, is critically important. Um, we come back to that one. And, and, and a third thing is new flexible consumption. We need to be able to really to absorb the amount of power when it's there meaning that, uh, for instance, the heating set sector should be able to take the power. Uh, also, the transportation will be able to, trans uh, to take some of the power, excess power we have, we have. And in the valleys, again, interconnectors. Hopefully, there will be some power north or south and east and west of Denmark that we can import in these days, hours. Uh, and uh, domestic flexible power production. Well, we will need power production also 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. Uh, we have in Denmark, as you may be aware, a lot of district heating. Uh, two thirds of our, our households uh, is on district heating. And, and they are provided with heat by uh, combined heat and power. And they are very flexible systems. We have uh, gas fire typically, and they are able to, to produce uh, power when prices go up and it is, um, it's a good business. So basically, that's, that's it. Here we have the map of, of interconnectors in and out of Denmark. We have already three HVDC to Norway. We're building a fourth now. We have uh, three to Sweden here. It's also HVDC and strong AC connection here and AC connection to Germany and HVDC here to Germany and building a new one, Krieger's flag, HVDC, to combine grid solution as mentioned before. And then we have a studies uh, of building new, a new connection to the UK and to the Netherlands, and yeah. A lot of connectors. We are a small country. Uh, our peak load is seven gigawatt. Our interconnectors, and I think that's comparable to yoga. Yeah. And our, our capacity in and out of the country is seven gigawatt. Meaning that, that I could manage security of supply without having any single uh, power plant running in Denmark. And uh, really, when I add all my capacity up together, uh, right now I have seven gigawatt of thermal capacity, I have seven gigawatt of interconnectors, and I have uh, four and soon six gigawatt of renewable. So I can basically, <laughs> I can supply on a good day, I can supply three times the power as we use. And that calls for interconnectors, basically. That calls for interconnectors. And, right, and all these interconnectors, we have a huge inflow of money because they, they are really money makers, these interconnectors. Both in terms, of, to my uh, pockets, but also in terms of society. Because it, it helps, I mean, directs the power to where the willingness to pay is highest. The value for society is highest. And it helps us to eliminate the non-productive power plants 
because only the, the productive power plant will be allowed to run. The unproductive will be kicked out of the market. Even if we have seven gigawatt of interconnectors, we are now building two more gigawatts because they have good business cases. They are good business cases. And it tells me that, for instance, Germany, that we have a very few interconnectors in and out of Germany, that, that there is room for improvements. Especially in the UK, I think they have only four gigawatt in and out of, of UK, and they have a peak load of 70 gigawatt or something like that. So there's a tremendous, uh, well, good opportunities there. And then finally, this is, I know it's a very busy slide, but it's, it's basically very simple. It says we have a well-integrated power infrastructure, that's a blue one. We have a well-integrated international gas structure that works. And then we have a heating system which is meshed between the power system and uh, the gas system. Moving forward to make this integration cost-effective, Really, we have to, to get the maximum out of this flexibility which is built into the heating system because our heating system can store heat for two, three days, week, <laughs> some of the plants for a month because they have big tanks where they can accumulate heat. So that means that when power prices is low or we have too much wind, well, they should just produce heat via heat pumps or boilers, uh, use electricity, very efficient. And when there's no wind, I mean, use the storage facility. That's, that's one part of the equation. So another part of the equation is that when the power, we have too much power, we can convert the power to gas. Problem here is efficiency. We lose 20, 30, 35% in this conversion. But because of this conversion, it either requires heat or create heat, if we can combine that with our heating system and use this excess heat, I mean, we can bring down the losses of the conversion. And uh, yeah, also the biomass can be uh, by thermal gasification or by biogas put into our gas storage facility. We have, we have uh, a lot of gas storage, underground gas storage facility where we can store energy, green energy, also to cover the values, values when we do not have wind. So, market interconnectors to rethink the power, gas, heating, and transport system and make them integrate. I think that's three critical elements to bring down the, the cost of this green uh, revolution. That was my presentation.